It's really good to be back here. This is my first GraphQL talk I've given in a while. Um, and really excited to tell you all about building custom tooling. So my talk, first, I want to start and talk a little bit about what has made GraphQL impactful for us working on the Stripe dashboard. I want to tell you a little bit about the tools that we've built internally to make our setup better. And then I want to explain and hopefully inspire you a little bit to build some of your own custom GraphQL tooling, whether that's for yourself personally or for your company. Before I go forward, I want to say that everything I'm presenting is a team effort from the whole team that I've been working with at Stripe. It takes a whole village to make a great development environment, and often when one person comes up and presents, it looks like you know, that one person did everything, but it's never the case. So what's special about the Stripe dashboard? So Stripe dashboard is the place that you log into to manage all of your different Stripe products, to set up your account, you know, put in your information, turn things on, do all that stuff. But I work on a team that works specifically on the dashboard, but most of the features are actually built by individual product teams that work on that product, like whether it's Stripe Billing or Connect or, or whatnot. But at the end of the day, even though a lot of people are contributing to this one code base, it needs to work together as a unified whole. And so that's kind of the challenge that we're working with as the dashboard team. So to recap, um, we're using a pretty standard front end stack, I would say, at Stripe working on the dashboard. We use React, Flow for static typing, Jest for testing, Webpack for our build system. On the back end, we use Ruby, um, quite well known as a Ruby shop. And most recently, we've added GraphQL and Apollo to that stack for data fetching and our API layer for the front end. So I want to start with and talk a little bit about what does it take to make product development better at your company and at a larger scale across multiple teams. So to talk about that, first we should maybe think about what does product development mean? And often when people talk about development, they put up one of these diagrams. You've got some data in your back end. You've got your API that you know, makes your data available to the outside world. And you've got a little bit of a front end that talks to that data and displays it. But I think looking at this diagram, we all know that it's not quite that simple. Actually, product development looks a little bit more like this, usually. There's all these other things you have to deal with when you're building a product that's not just writing the code to make your application work. You have to make sure you do testing. You make sure you have static types to catch bugs. Probably have different backends, not just one that you're working with. And you need to monitor to make sure it all works in production. Um, and so actually, you have to consider all these different things when you're trying to impact product development at your company. So initially, when we were adding Apollo and GraphQL, we were like, this is cool. We're going to replace our state management. We're going to improve our API layer. But it turns out that the impact has been far, far wider because GraphQL, I think, is one of the relatively unique technologies that actually can impact all the different parts of your product development process. Um, so I would say that that's kind of one of the key things that has made GraphQL so impactful for us, and I think why it's worthwhile to have a whole conference about this, is that it impacts so many different parts of the development process in so many, so many ways. So We've all you know, learned a little bit about GraphQL before. We're going to hear a bunch of talks about different benefits that GraphQL might have for your company. There's one in particular that I want to focus on. And I would say that for us in the Stripe dashboard team, the main benefit we've gotten from GraphQL has been being able to rely on the wealth of GraphQL tooling and content uh, that we can use. So for example, some of the tools that we use, pretty much as is, like you would use them in any of your own, your own apps, our Apollo client for data fetching and data management with our React application. We use GraphQL Ruby to define our server, like GitHub and Shopify do. We use the Apollo CLI to generate static types for our front end. And we use GraphQL tools to make it really easy for us to mock data for tests and in our component explorer. But that's not all. Uh, I would be remiss not to mention the content documentation that's out there in the community has been just as important as the actual tools. because. If you have a lot of internal tools that are highly specific at your company, that's a cost you have to pay every time that you onboard somebody onto your team. But when we get to use standard tools from the community, that cuts down that time. And if somebody has used GraphQL, React, all these things before at their last job, when they join our team now, they don't have to learn really that much new stuff. They can just come in and use all the tools that they're comfortable with. And that's, they can also rely on all this wonderful documentation in the community. So what is it about GraphQL that enables it to have this great impact on all these aspects of product development? I think it's because it's one of the first really widely used API technologies that carefully defines 
both the capabilities that are available in the server. You have to have a schema that describes all the types in your API. And it's got the sophisticated query language for defining data requirements. And a lot of the tools that you might use for GraphQL leverage both of these things together to have impact across the stack. Also, there are a couple of other things about GraphQL that make it uniquely suited uh, for you to be able to build great tools on top of it. So as I mentioned, the fact that it integrates across front end and back end, but also the fact that you can rely on your back end schema actually existing and being correct. A lot of other schema tools for APIs are optional or don't validate that your API actually matches that schema. But GraphQL does. It'll be a fatal error if you try to return the wrong thing. And lastly, I would say it's really great that the spec and the ecosystem have been relatively stable, which means that you can build a tool on top of the GraphQL spec. And if you built a tool three years ago, it'll still pretty much work today, because the specification has been carefully curated to not change in dramatic ways, which I really appreciate. And all these things combined, I think, make it really worthwhile to build internal tooling about GraphQL as well. So not just the community tools that you see people publish, but custom things that you use internally to make your workflow better. So let me tell you a little bit about the custom tools that we built around GraphQL at Stripe. The first thing I want to talk about is mocking. So as you may know, mocking is a really, really useful tool that can make it easier for you to write more resilient tests so they don't have to call your actual API in production, make it possible to develop components more quickly for your UI. You can even do development before your backend is implemented. And sometimes if you're trying to test using an actual application or a production site or whatever, it can be really hard to get into those finicky edge cases. And if you can mock your API out, it's really easy to test those edge cases, especially automatically. So as you may know, if you've tried to do mocking with a GraphQL API, one aspect of GraphQL that makes it really easy to do automatic mocking is that because you have a schema and you have static types, um, you can automatically generate mocks for pretty much any GraphQL query against an API. Some of you might already be doing this. Um, you just pass it any query, and you get the right result of the correct shape. Unfortunately, when we started to go down the road of using these automatic mocks with GraphQL in our code base, we realized that it became a little bit harder to test for specific edge cases. We wanted to make sure that we could test different error states, different loading states, or specific types of data that might be rendered differently by our components. And so we looked into the docs in the community, and we found that um, for that case, a lot of people recommended per request mocking. So as with any other kind of API, you specify the particular request you're looking for, and then you specify the response for that request. And that's great because it lets you specify the edge cases that you're looking for. But unfortunately, it kind of takes you all the way back to the pre-GraphQL world and has quite a lot of boilerplate for every test that you want to write. So we were like, how can we get the best of both worlds? We want to have those global automatic mocks, but we also want to be able to test those edge cases. And so we've come up with a system that feels new to me. I haven't seen it too much in the community, um, where we actually have the ability to use global mocks but with specific local overrides for the individual test that you're writing. So when you write a GraphQL query in one of our tests or component examples, you don't have to write mocks for the whole response, but only for the specific part that you're trying to test. And I'll show you a little bit about what that looks like. So let's say you're just trying to check if you have a component that renders. And by the way, these code samples are just copy and pasted from my code base, so I had to pick ones that are <laughs> safe to share. Um, if you just want to test if your page renders, uh, all you have to do is wrap it in our Apollo testing provider, render the component, and you're good to go. All the fake data is generated for you automatically based on the model. But then if you want to override the fields, you can actually override just the fields that you're trying to test at the top of the test, render your component using that same test provider, and then at the bottom, assert for those fields that you passed in at the top. And so this kind of like, to me, makes sense a lot if you're trying to test that those components are rendering that data correctly. Um, so this is what it looks like to write a test in our system. And we've decided to have special providers for particular edge cases that come up all the time. So we have a special loading provider, an error provider, and the loading provider just makes all queries underneath it load forever, and the error provider makes all the queries underneath it always return error. And so therefore, it's really easy to test those. And last but not least, we have an internal prototyping tool that we call SailPen 
which is kind of like CodePen, but for our internal component system. So you can import any of our React components and directly in your browser, prototype any kind of UI that you might be able to build in the Stripe dashboard. And we've actually built GraphQL mocking right into that. So it turns out that if you're trying to build a new feature and you just want to play around with something, you can easily import our component system and import our GraphQL schema and directly in your browser basically prototype a whole feature right there. And that's been hugely impactful, not just for developers, but for designers in our organization that don't want to deal with setting up all the systems, but they are very excited to use this tool. So overview of mocking, we've got the automatic global mocks, but we've got the ability to override for specific edge cases that we want to test. We can easily test error states, easily test loading states, and we can even use those mocks in our prototyping tool. Um, if you want to read more, we published recently a blog post about that that you can check out at that URL. I'll also post the slides later. So moving on, I want to talk about another tool that we've built at Stripe around schema management. As I mentioned, we've got this one product that a lot of different teams are contributing to. And so we want to have one GraphQL schema, but we want people to be able to make changes to it independently without having to get a review from like, the whole rest of the company. So that means we want some automated tooling to make sure that we don't accidentally break different things in our code base when somebody is trying to make an isolated change. So one of the most impactful things for that has been to have a canonical schema file that we always commit to Git. And hopefully this is something that many of you are doing already. Um, we take all of our API code, we print out a file, and then that way it's really easy when you open a pull request to see the diff in the schema. You don't have to read all the code. You can just see what fields people are adding. And it's even really easy to track the history of how that schema is changing over time just using your regular you know, Git tools or whatever. And that schema.graphql file also powers all of our internal developer tools, like, for example, generating static types for our front end using the Apollo CLI. But on top of that, we've also built something that has been really impactful for us, which is a breaking, a breaking change detector. So in GraphQL.js, there are a couple of utilities you can use to detect breaking changes. And so in our CI, we have something that checks out the schema from master and looks at your current schema and detects any breaking changes there. Because even though we were already using static types to make sure that our front end and back end code is compatible, it turns out that people leave their uh, browser tabs open for quite a long time. And so even though the current code may be compatible, somebody who opened the web page two days ago or four days ago uh, might encounter an error if they try to hit an incompatible API. So this has been really useful to enable people to kind of self-serve, make changes to the schema without us worrying that something's going to break. So to recap that, um, custom GraphQL tools are great because the spec is really stable, so you can rely on them working for a long time. It's really convenient to build them because you can leverage all kinds of different community tools like GraphQL.js, Apollo CodeGen, Babel. And as you can see with these two examples, it's been really nice for us to have tools that are directly integrated into the environment that we have at Stripe, like our component system and prototyping tool and our specific CI environment and ways that we do those things. So now I want to tell you a little bit about how you can build your own tools for GraphQL. Uh, so I was thinking about what kind of tool would I want to have uh, that doesn't exist yet. And um, I kind of intentionally didn't build it until I wanted to give this talk, because then there wouldn't be anything to talk about, I guess. But let's say we have our GraphQL schema, and we have our code base with a bunch of React files with a bunch of GraphQL queries in them. And we want to figure out where is a particular field actually used in our code base. That's actually a question I have quite frequently. Um, how do we build a tool like that? So OK, so I'm going to walk you through all the steps with all the individual code and all the different tools that we're going to use to actually build this. We're not going to live code, because live coding a presentation is fraught. But we're going to walk through all the code required to build this tool, and then you can download that code later and play around with it yourself. So first, we've got to get the GraphQL schema from our code. We've got to find all the GraphQL queries in our code base, which means going through a bunch of JavaScript files. And then we've got to search through those queries for the field that we're looking for. So let's see how we can do all those different parts using existing GraphQL tools. So first, getting our schema. Um, Prisma has thankfully published this wonderful tool called GraphQL config, which makes it really easy to just put a config file in your repository that points to your schema.graphql file. And then in your CLI tool, all you have to do is require the library 
and then you call a single function and it gets you the schema. And this config file actually has the ability to do a lot of cool things like manage multiple schemas, different names, all this stuff. Um, so you can kind of outsource it to that library. So now we've got access to our schema object. Next, we've got to find the GraphQL queries in our front end code base. So I think most people are using some sort of tool like Relay or Apollo Client that has you tag all of your GraphQL queries in your code base with a special template literal. So in this case, you can see that even though our query is a string, it's tagged with this GQL in the front. And that's really important because that's what lets your tools identify those queries. So now we're going to go into something that I initially thought was going to be really difficult. But you know, a lot of us use Babel to compile our code, but maybe not as many of us are using Babel to write our own custom internal tooling. And it turns out that it doesn't take a lot of lines of code to get something useful done. So first, what we've got to do is load up the files in our source code um, using just regular file system stuff. And then we can use the parse function we can import from Babel to convert that into an AST, which is kind of a data structure that represents our code. So now we've got that AST. Then we can use a second function from Babel called traverse, which basically lets us take this AST and look for specific parts of the code. In this case, we're interested in looking for a tag template expression. So we look for all the tag template expressions, which are going to represent those strings that are tagged. We check if the name of the tag is GQL. And then that lets us easily go through a source file and collect all of the strings that are GraphQL queries. So now we've got a list of all these GraphQL strings. So before I go on, one thing I want to remark on is a really useful tool that you can use if you're trying to build stuff like this, which is AST Explorer. So at astexplorer.net, you can type in any JavaScript code and even GraphQL code and get a sense of what that data structure looks like on the right. So you can see on, on the right side of the screen, it helpfully tells you that part is called a tag template expression. OK. So now that we've got these GraphQL strings, we're going to look for the fields in those GraphQL queries. So very similar to before, we want to convert our GraphQL string into a data structure that represents our GraphQL query. So we're going to import the parse function now from the GraphQL library, um, which actually includes not just you know, the GraphQL execution code that you might be used to if you're building a GraphQL server, but actually the GraphQL package includes a ton of different tools for working with GraphQL queries and building all kinds of tools. So we're going to parse that GraphQL string into an AST as before. And similar to Babel's traverse function, GraphQL has a function called visit, and in particular, visit with type info, which is very useful because it can tell you what GraphQL type the field is that you're currently looking at. So we can traverse that query, use the type info to get the name of the parent type, and then use the actual field that we're on to get the name of the field. Um, and then we can then compare that if it's the field we're looking for. So for completeness, comparing if it's the field we're looking for would look like this. We look at uh, you know, uh, the name of the field and all the other stuff. And then we can just really easily print out a line to our console that says, hey, I found the field you were looking for. It's in this file name, on this line, this operation name. So putting all that together, uh, first parse the GraphQL query, then traverse it, check if it's the field you want, print it out to your console. And we're mostly pretty much done. So we've just built that tool that we were talking about. And if you put it all together, uh, you can pretty much just call it. And this is, again, just something I ran on our dashboard code base. So you can pass it a type and a field name. And then it just prints out nicely for you all of the different files that contain that field. Um, so as I mentioned before, you can download that code. I have a gist on GitHub at bit.ly slash GraphQL field finder. Um, and so we used the GraphQL config library to get access to our schema. We used GraphQL tag to make sure that we've identified all the queries in our JavaScript code base. They're not just plain strings. We've used Babel to extract query strings from our JavaScript code. And we used GraphQL.js to traverse those queries and then find the ones that we were looking for. And so I encourage you to take those tools that you've learned about. Um, and I think that building custom GraphQL tools inside your company and then possibly sharing them with the community as an open source library or similar can be a really, really impactful way to improve your product development process. I um, also want to mention that if you want to work on stuff like this, we're hiring at Stripe in all kinds of different locations in Europe and around the world. 
And if you have any questions about my presentation, GraphQL in general, please find me after the talk, or we can hang out or email me. Thank you so much. And up next, we've got Sasha from Twitter to tell us about error handling in GraphQL. Welcome. <laughs>